want people to speak at some point. So do you have the capacity to unmute people? If I yes, ask I, a question. Yes, I have the capacity to unmute the people. And also we'll use the chat box as well. Yes. Okay. So just to be clear, you're just using the informal Zoom. So will we break at 40 minutes? Because the lecture is one hour, 20 minutes. So there, no, you said- No, no, no there is no, no break. Uh, we will purchase this version. So uh, now it's unlimited version. It's almost two oh, hours. Oh, wonderful. Well, the lecture won't be more than an hour and a half with questions, depending how discussive you are. Yes. Okay. So um, just to give a little bit, my background is important because where my perspective comes from, I, I haven't had a very conventional career. I've spent uh, 25 years as a psychiatrist with different agencies, mostly with a big one called International Medical Corps, mm -hmm. setting up mental health programs in emergency settings, both disasters and war zones. For example, I was in Balakot after the earthquake in 2005 for three months. Uh, I really loved being in Pakistan, I should say. I met so many good people. Oh, you work in Balakot? Yes, I did, yes. Oh, great. And then when I was in Afghanistan, I came in and out. Uh, that was a long time ago, in 2003. Of course, I had to come in and out through Peshawar, where my NGO had a program, and I got to know very good people. And then one of my colleagues who I first met in Pakistan became a very much more famous than me, eminent professor in the UK, Atif Rahman. Um, and um, yeah, so I've had some connections with Pakistan, which I've really enjoyed. This lecture, uh, one of the things that you, work, you, you come across if you work in war zones and disasters is that people suffer a lot of loss and it's become a particular interest of mine Coincidentally, just before this pandemic started, I had just completed a chapter on the subject of grief and loss in refugees and displaced families, um, which I will ask the editor to make available to you. The book is just coming out, so they're very touchy, but um, I did this lecture for you in HCR last week and they gave everybody the chapter. Of course, it doesn't deal with the pandemic, but many of the issues are the same. And I've adapted the lecture a little bit for you. I'm not going to talk specifically about refugees. I'm just going to try and talk generally about all of us and look at the following issues. Really, first of all, you know, sort of fundamentally, what is grief <laughs> and why we grieve? And my little bit on attachment, because I don't think we can understand grief without understanding attachment. I'll look at the stage theory of grief. And I'll come to that. I'll look at the physical and mental health effects of grief and whether it's abnormal or not. And then perhaps the most important part of this lecture is mourning and how that has been affected by the pandemic. And so, and some tips that maybe, I'm not gonna do a whole lecture, maybe more when we come to how we help others, I'll go into more detail, but how we support people, sorry, I went ahead, um, who are grieving. Okay, so, um, I'm so used to doing this with Q&A, but um, in this, you can't answer me verbally, but you know, one of the things I get asked is, you know, why grief is such a painful experience? Why do we have to have it? Why have we not evolved to be free of grief? You can mute and yourself. One, I allow the one word answers. unmute themselves, so you will answer them now. Okay, if you want, I was going to say right in the chat box, I'm just yeah. seeing if I can see my chat box. Um, sorry, I've gone, I gave the answer wrongly. Um, how, how do I, I'm just trying to work out how to, ah, I want to get to the chat box and I can't find it. Hang on. Just scribble your answers here as to why you think we grieve. Uh, yeah, just, I've got the chat box in front of me now. Just, um, could you, I don't know what happened, why this went to, the trouble is when I have the chat box, I lost the, sorry guys, I'm, I've, all the other time lectures I've given have not been on Zoom. Right, I now have the chat box and my slides. Just one word answers, guys. Why do we grieve? Anyone? Grief on when someone will be lost. Someone said attachment. Yes. You can't hear me? Uh, yes, we you can hear you. You can't hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right, good. Good. Yes, well, you, I had already given you a clue. We grieve because we love. We grieve when we lose someone we love. Yeah, and compounded during crisis. Okay, I'm gonna move on because of our time, because you've already 
given me the answer I really want. Now my slides aren't moving. Why not? Yes. Grief is the price of love. There's no question. The reason we grieve is because we lose someone we love, or let's be very clear, we don't just grieve for people. We grieve for places. If you had the experience of displacement or even moving, you grieve for somewhere you've moved away. We grieve for objects. We grieve for lives. We grieve for health. We grieve when we lose something that matters to us. Okay? So what I want to do, just very briefly, another exercise in your chat box, which again, I'm trying to bring up. I find it. There we go. Just in the chat box, just write what have you lost that you are missing it doesn't i'm very sorry if it is a person and you've lost family members uh very sad of course that's the most important but what other things have you lost because of this virus in your life just jot some things down time with friends absolutely keep going give me some more ideas i mean that is so important we have Three. lost the university hello hello we just the lost family. our universities, our studies, our Please, different uh, activities. Could you, could you write? Could you write? It's very distracting for me if you talk. I, I can't read the writing as well. Could you just write? I'm so sorry. Uh, Ahmed, I think it's better to mute everybody unless I ask. Sorry. Yeah, lovely. Sorry, Maria, but if one person talks and others are writing, I, I'm completely disorientated. We lost our goals, workplace, colleagues loved ones yes going outside it's a really big list of losses and very important things anything else health social life what i'm seeing um we lost our goals is we have a distinction also between losses that are outside ourselves our families our friends our time outside and we lose things that are inside ourselves that are internal our sense of our freedom, maybe our belief in the future, our security. I haven't seen that yet, but it's a big thing here. We don't feel safe anymore. We worry about monies, our imagination of the future. Great, everybody, you're getting idea. Loss is a big thing in our lives at the moment. And it's why I start with loss rather than, I'm, I'm, rather than uh, stress. Now, the other side, and you've already in a way touched on this, okay, is one of the reasons our losses are so great is that human beings are extremely connected. You know, social connection is what, in a sense, our lives are about. And another very good thing to do, and again, I'm going to, don't worry, I'm going to not make you work so hard after the beginning of the lecture, but I really want to show you how much you know. Could you again in the chat box just briefly write down your top three connections, okay? Three networks to which you belong. I, for example, have my international network of humanitarian psychiatrists. I have my family, obviously, and I have my street with whom I'm very connected at the moment. Um, so that's an example for me. Just jot down three networks. Those are all completely different and don't overlap at all, by the way. Three networks that you belong to. Just put them down in the chat box. Okay, yes. Just try and label some of the networks that you belong to. You're quite wrong. Isolation, that's what I'm getting at. University, lovely, is one network. Just jot down some networks. Your study network, yes, like university, this is a very big one. Family, university, relatives, college. People you randomly stumble upon, I love that, absolutely. They become important in your life. Job, yes, and it's interesting. There's one I'm not seeing at the moment that's kind of missing that I expected to see. Do none of you belong to faith communities? Yes, definitely. Yeah, somebody's put that down. I mean, it's funny because often it's the first network I get. Jogging track, absolutely. Personal self-care activities, okay. Montessori students, you're a teacher. Lovely, I bet you miss them. Right, you're getting the idea. International Medical Corps. Is somebody belonging to IMC here? That's very interesting. Um, and don't write to me privately, everybody. Please do, with these shared questions, 
would you be kind enough to share them with the group? But don't worry, they're not going to be that many more. Okay. Now, I had a look at Pakistan online before I did this lecture because I thought I must see what's going on there. And one of the things that struck me, it was, and this is where you're really going to educate me, is how disrupted are your connections? Because it seems to me that lockdown and has not been implemented like it was. We changed it today and we've gone bonkers in Britain. Don't let me get onto that. But until yesterday, we had a very severe lockdown here. So most of my connections went online. They weren't necessarily disrupted, but they moved online. Uh, could you tell me what of your, what's the most important connection that's been broken for you in the chat box that's actually been broken, that you don't have anymore, that something you can't connect to that you want to? Just, just give me a, a, an idea, one from each of you. Because here you are in a university lecture, so maybe you, the canteen, yes. The hangout, you can't go to a social space. Absolutely, you're putting a finger on it. So the places where you met your friends are not available to you. What about going to the mosque? You can't go, are you, you're locked down so you can't go outside even to meet your family, right? Meeting grandparents, mosque, absolutely. Difficulty being with other cousins, so you're probably living with your holy places, right? And these are very important places. We are learning a lot, all of us, about the importance of social connection. Thank you guys for being such lovely participants. You'll be glad to know that I am not going to push you so much for a little bit. What I want to get across and what I want to talk about now, and somebody used this word early on, is the connection between grief and attachment. It is so important, which is why I'm going to spend a moment talking about attachment. I just realized I haven't got my watch to time myself. But I'm, uh, um, will you tell me when I've done 45 minutes, um, Ahmed, just so I keep my time? Um, tell me when I'm halfway through. I use this picture because for me it sums up in a way everything about grief and attachment. Actually, this is after Hurricane Haiyan in the Philippines, and this little boy could swim, and his parents could not, and I don't know if you remember that disaster, but the wave came, nobody expected it, they were hunkered down to protect themselves from a hurricane, and many, many, 10,000 people died in a day, including both his parents, and his losses are so great First of all, he didn't have a proper funeral. His family just buried in this mass uh, made up graveyard in a church, outside a church. They don't usually bury people there. Two, you can see behind him his school, which is completely destroyed. He can't go to school. He has no family. That's his friend who's come with him. And every day, what he does is come to this grave and clean this little sign. And you can see he's physically attached to it. He spends his day with his memory of his mum and dad. And he's grieving. And he's trying to maintain the connection with parents that he longs for and he misses. For me, this is a picture of grief and attachment. And I'm just going to get a little bit technical because I think, and you're psychologists, it really is worth for understanding not just grief, but many disorders and many of the ways we cope depend on the kind of attachments we formed as children. Now, the interesting thing about human beings is in common with higher mammals, including elephants, dogs, cats, monkeys, and all kinds of dolphins, we connect deeply to the group. And it's that ability to do that that's allowed us to survive. If we were terrapins or snakes when we were born, that would be it. We'd run for the beach or run for safety, no attachment. We survive or die, often die, on our own, on our own abilities. But human beings, especially babies, without teeth, claws, scales like reptiles, all they've got is their connection to each other. And so if you put your baby down, even for a moment, and leave, then the baby is likely to cry, and you will feel that cry and come running back because you care about it, and that's the baby's protection. And the baby is feeling a sense of loss. I've used these two pictures from two utterly different time periods and two utterly different cultures to show you young children across the world have these feelings. One is a picture of an American Air Force man coming back, greeting his wife, and look how his two-year-old son is reacting. He is so pleased to see his daddy. The other is a picture of the Mexican border where a mother has been separated from her child and is then reunited. Mexican little girl 
exactly the same position. It's so interesting to me that the photographers caught this moment of reconnection and the importance of it. Of course, we all know this. If any of you are parents, you know how your child under three shows when, how they behave, what happens if they're upset, if they're injured, if you go away. My husband has a lovely saying that I'm going to share with you. It's from Ethiopia. My husband's Ethiopia and it's the child whose mother goes to the supermarket and the child whose mother dies both cry. I, we know with small infants, they don't know when the mother leaves what the reason is. They know they need their mother and she has to come back. And that again shows you the close connection between attachment and death. We see different behaviors when a child is separated, a young child. This is actually this little girl who's wailing and weeping. Her mother left the room for five minutes and she's protesting. If mother doesn't come back, the protest is likely to grow greater. She may actually despair. She may actually stop crying and not want to play with other children. But if it goes on, she may then creep back into the game and think, oh, well, doesn't really care. And then when mom comes back, gets really angry before she re-engages. These behaviors have been studied across the world and they're very common and they're similar in all of us. And I've given you a long quote here, which I'm not going to read, but this man, if you're a psychologist, I hope you have already heard of him. You will read him if you haven't. And he beautifully summarizes and helps us understand attachment behavior. And as he points out, it's observed through the life cycle, all human beings in varying patterns, integral to human nature, shared with other species, and the function attributed to it is protection. We attach to others in order to be safe. Now, what's the relationship to death? Well, I think as good young psychologists, you're probably already aware. Death, of course, like the mother who goes to the supermarket, but the mother who dies, death is permanent loss, okay? And what many people studying have seen is that when someone dies, we behave like that small child whose mother has left the room or gone out or go away. We're angry, we may protest, we long for them. Look at that little boy, we yearn for them. We try to regain the connection. This heartbreaking picture is of a woman who's heard of the death of her relative and you see the yearning just in the posture of her body. Now, I have to deal with this because one of the important things for all of us is not to do harm. Now, I'm gonna be a little bit complicated and in question time, stop me and explore it further if you want. But because of this work on attachment, some grief theorists at the same time in the 50s and 60s came up with something called the stage theory of grief, which is the idea that everybody had to grieve in the same way, working through stages of grief. Starting with shock and disbelief, you don't believe it's happened, denial, some use, people use that term. Moving on to that sadness and despair that we saw in that little girl and we saw in that woman, the yearning, then moving on to being angry and then coming to terms with the death. And the problem with this stage theory was not that some people didn't do it, some did. Elizabeth Kupler-Ross studied people. She saw people moving through these stages. I am not denying that. Nobody does. The problem is some people do it, some people don't. Some people only have one of these feelings. Some people don't have any of them. Some people have all of them all at once. And if you learn nothing else from me today, please understand there is no correct way to grieve. Everybody grieves differently and we do not all grieve in stages. And therefore, one of the psychological interventions that was very popular in this country, I don't know about yours, 10 years ago, and still is, when I teach, I still find grief workers. Oh yes, I go out and I help my clients work through their stages of grief. And if they're in denial, I have to make them talk and cry. Otherwise, they're not grieving properly. This does harm. And I will come back to it when I come back to interventions. But please understand the theory does not apply to everybody. It applies to a few people. If people are not grieving in this way, they're not grieving wrongly. How you grieve is going to depend on who you are. 
How did people show emotions in your family? Were you all stoical and nobody cried? Or were you a weeping and wailing family? And that will depend on your culture, your gender, your age, the circumstances of the death. Was it sudden and unexpected? A little boy drowned in the river? Was it a 28 year old working in the hospital dying of COVID? Was it your grandfather who'd had cancer and dementia for 10 years and you really felt that death put him out of his suffering? These deaths are utterly different and how you respond to them will be different. Also, what happens to you when that person dies? Are there legal problems or do you inherit a fortune? That's going to affect how you grieve. But most important probably is you, your temperament, your gender, your age, your style, and where you live and how people around you grieve. Which is why when people say, well, you say no stages, what, how do people have, what emotions do people have in grief? And as you see, I've made a long list. There are many feelings, anxiety, depression, anger. You may have some of them, you may have all of them, you may have none of them. You're very likely to feel lonely, and as that woman in Ecuador showed, be yearning and longing, or you might, especially if your life is very full of worries and preoccupations. For example, you're a refugee, you're on the move, you haven't got time to grieve. You've got to take care of the children. Or you're dealing with unemployment and no money because of lockdown. You may not be showing any reaction. What about your thinking? Many different kinds of thinking, again, I've listened to them, including deciding not to think about it or thinking about it all the time and being worried having even suicidal ideas, that's more serious, having the sense of disconnection and unreality that some people report. Your behavior, again, very variable. Some people are restless and overactive. Some people withdraw and shut down. There are cultural expectations. Now, I'm not familiar with Pakistan, but for example, Muslim culture in Sri Lanka, a woman was expected to withdraw totally for four months shut herself away, have no social contact. She would be fed and looked after by her family and only after those four months of total withdrawal was she allowed to reconnect. We can talk about how useful that is, but that created a behavioral expectation. It also, I noticed, because I had to see these women, had a profound effect on their physiology. And I actually found some of these women in a state of, you would almost say depression, not eating, not sleeping, with many somatic complaints. Indeed, Oh, I've got this model first, yeah. Grief does affect our physiology, I'll come back to that. But I wanted to share this model with you first. This is not a stage theory. What I like about this model, and take time to look at this slide afterwards, and there are many papers on it, is that what it shows you, if you look at the top two, is that actually many of us fluctuate between different states in grief. Yes, at some point, and it might not be immediate, it might be two weeks down the line or a year's line, we feel pain, sadness, yearning, and we don't want to move on. We don't want to start a new life. My landlord, after the tsunami in Aceh, I stayed in a house in a village which had been utterly de devastated and the majority of people had died, including his 16 year old daughter. He had a shrine in one of the rooms None of us are allowed to go in. And every day he spent half the day in there. Her clothes were laid out, her pictures were all over the house. And this was like her room untouched. You would call that a loss orientation. He didn't want any changes made. When I came back six months later, he had actually made it into a normal room that he let out to us because he needed money, you could say, but also because he felt he had moved on. He hadn't forgotten his daughter. But he wasn't thinking about her all the time and every day. He had taken on his new role, if you like, or his old role again as a landlord, not a grieving father. But all of these, which one you're in, is also going to depend on the kind of culture you're in. So I lived in a multicultural city, a city in the Balkans that had both Muslim and Serbs in it after the war in the Balkans. And the Orthodox Serbs, at their funerals, the women would be present, they would be wailing and crying, their, their aprons over their heads. There was an expectation that the women would cry, almost keen in this way. It was a way of the community expect, expect, expressing grief. But in the same town, same nation, the Muslims did not like their women to go to funerals because women cried. And there was an expectation, as the men explained to me, of 
be different in Pakistan, I'm just explaining here. So stoical cultures, ventilating cultures, but also, as I've said, the kind of death, the kind of family style. What this model I like about it is the variation and the possibility to move between different styles of grieving. Most summed up, and I put this in, especially for you in a way, this is after the Balakot earthquake. And here we have two 14-year-old girls from very culture. They both came from villages in the mountains. This girl in the bottom of the picture is living in a very army displaced persons camp. Her mother died in the village. Her aunt has her looking after the four younger children. The aunt has told the mother that mother is in the village. I, she asked me to see the girl. I was asked to see her as a child psychiatrist because the girl has a kind of depressive reaction. She's not eating. She's not doing her jobs properly, the aunt tells me. I asked the aunt, has she told her mother what's, hap um, what's happened? No, we, we don't want to upset her. I asked the girl what she thinks has happened to her mother. The girl says, I think she's dead. So the girl is utterly confused, as you can imagine. And what my job was to help clear communication, to help honest communication, but also to help the aunt allow the child not to be a young adult with all these responsibilities, but to do distracting activities like play and go. If she wished. destroyed this little girl with a lovely hand and be distracted it's very upsetting and sometimes I cry so as reactions you have imitate illness we know that the loss of sleep the loss of appetite, the thinking constantly about the dead person's sadness. This is very like a depressive illness, but it isn't, which is why in ICD-10 and 11, grief is an excluder for depression. You know what I'm talking about, ICD-10 and 11 is. Yes, Ahmed, I'm, I'm, I'm just asking, I'm talking about diagnostic categories in uh, psychiatry, but your psychologist at some time you'll come across depressive illness contrary to what DSM-5 says, but we can discuss that in questions. Yes, all medical students get this trick question in their exam in Britain. When is it normal to have hallucinations bereavement? Because it is a very common experience for people who have lost someone to see them, to talk to them, to hear their voice. And they may say so, as my grandmother did after my grandfather died. I hear him every day. They may even lay the table and have a chat to him. Nothing wrong with that if it doesn't interfere with function, and it's not psychosis. Similarly, if it's, especially if it's a traumatic death, you may have flashbacks of it. You may relive the experience of that person dying. I had one of my first experiences as a medical student on a clinical ward was a 14-year-old child very sadly die very abruptly in front of me while I was actually taking the history. And I tried to resuscitate her and then the crash team came and I swept out the way. But for 11 days afterwards, I replayed that death and me trying to resuscitate her in my mind. That's a normal stress reaction. It's a normal reaction to a death. It is not PTSD. The fact is that most of us will get better. But the other side of that coin is that, yes, we know that grieving people do have a greater vulnerability to those illnesses I've mentioned which is why you have to take time to understand what's going on. And what you're looking at, it's going to go here. When you want to say that you're moving into illness is when you see that the grief gets in the way of function a long time after the person has died. Now, I think for you, psychologists at university, you take a lot. I disorder. Again, the most important thing to understand in your culture are the best people in much, not knowing the cultural norms, not knowing the norms for your family. You can't say, oh, this woman has been grieving for six months and shut away or four months and she seems she's 
still in that state and doesn't want to do the normal things that she's expected to do, you might be doing with prolonged grief disorder. And yes, grief can make people physically ill. We know from the research that you do have more, tend to go to hospital morning, but the yearning and so on. But um, it does have health consequences. One of the most interesting, and this is research done on men in my country in the United States, is that grief makes you more vulnerable to the illnesses that would kill you anyway. So particularly widowers, and this may tell you something about the role of women in men's life, are more vulnerable to dying of heart attacks, strokes, loneliness in the early months after they lose their wives. That might tell you something about, this research was done a few weeks, few decades ago, tell you something about the role of women in men's lives. Um, so, I've just said this, but I'll emphasize it again. The decision as to what is abnormal and inappropriate depends on an understanding of the family and the culture. You can't decide what's abnormal without cultural and personal knowledge. And I this quote from Freud, consulted by a woman who had become depressed following the death of her husband. After listening to her quietly, Freud stated, Madam, you do not have a neurosis, you have a misfortune. He, he understood the difference between grief and depression. I wish that the American diagnostic manual writers had also understood it. It's very worrying to me that one of the major diagnostic systems in the world has now said, basically, if you're grieving, you're sick. I think that's a mistake. We can discuss that if you want at the end. This, in a sense, is the most important part of the lecture. Ahmed, what time is it? Can you tell me, please? Muted. Ahmed, you're muted. It's uh, 4.35 Pakistan and UK 11.35. 11.35, perfect. Yeah, 3.35. Yeah, 3.35 is it. Yeah, that's exactly the time I wanted to be. Thank you so much. So, why? Because this, for me, in a sense, is the most important part of the lecture. Uh, I actually will take a, a tiny pause there because I, I went quite fast. And um, I'd like to know if there are any questions. I know there might be a lot to discuss, but are there any questions around understanding things that you, I wasn't clear or you didn't understand? Could you just write them in the chat box right now if you have any? None. Oh, how lovely. <laughs> None, says so she. Great. Okay, I'm clear so far. If I don't get any others, I will carry on. Okay. Anyway, we'll have time at the end. So, here's the interesting thing about mourning. Everybody does it. Indeed, we now know, I find this really interesting because I did animal behavior at university, that elephants do it, that many higher mammals also mourn. What's mourning? It is the processes that all societies have adopted to help individuals deal with the pain of grief. So mourning is not grief. Mourning is what we do in order to deal with grief. And of course, that is going to depend on the culture in which we live, and they all do it differently. But they, when you look at mourning practices, you will see that what they have in common is acknowledgement and acceptance of the death. Saying goodbye, allocated time periods, completely different in different cultures. I, what was fascinating to me working in the Balkans was that the time periods were different within the Muslim culture across the Balkans. Different countries had different time periods. Very interesting. Processes to continue attention towards the dead. So a way to continue to show respect and to move beyond it and make new attachments. So I don't know why sometimes when I click this, it doesn't move on. Okay, what I'd like you to do, I hope you have got pens or paper, but do it as a mental exercise if you haven't. Not in the chat box because it'll be too much, just in your head or on a piece of paper. Can you jot down what are the burial customs in your own family, village, community. Now, I know that you're probably all from the same religious culture, but as I said, I learned in the Balkans that even one religion has cultural variations. So I'd still like you to just jot down and think, 
what do we do? What happens to the body? Who visits? What sort of funeral do we have? Cremation, burial? Is there different roles for men, women? Do children come or not? Are there stages? In Kosovo, the first seven days is intense morning. You have a chair outside the house. You hang a towel over the chair to indicate someone had died. The next 40 days is a kind of moving out of that phase and so on. So it's different. I never met the seven day period in any other country, but it's very interesting to me. How do you remember the dead in the long term? What sort of memorial? Catholic graveyards are totally different to Protestant ones in my country. What's the role of the dead in continuing family life? If you live in China, in some places, they have the ashes in the family home forever and you can go and talk to them. How do you maintain connection? Just, just have a quick jot down on a piece of paper your answers to some of those questions. Somebody asked me in the chat box, can they have the slides? Of course you can, I'll be sending them a link to Ahmed. So don't worry, you don't have to write down everything on the slides, you can have the slides. Okay, I've given you a little bit of time to think about it. What I'd really like is if one person would be so bold, and this is where Ahmed would turn on, on your speaker. If, you, if you've if you got Zoom, the, the, the complete view, Ahmed, you can see everybody's faces. If you could just wave your hand. I can't see all faces at once anymore. Let me wave your hand if you would like to volunteer to just share well, morning practices are in Can you please turn on your cameras and I can only take one, but I'd love to yes. Yeah, everybody. Ahmed, you choose someone. Uh, yes, Vajia. Vajia, I think. Lovely. Vajia? Vajia Khan, is that you? I think there is some distortion. Yes, uh, uh, Majia, now you are uh, unmuted. I, I unmuted you. Majia, can you listen? Hello? Hello? Yes, please. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, you are the volunteer to answer these questions. The dead. Sir, in our religion, the sir, in our religion, can you please open your camera as soon as possible? The body in the is then there is a prayer, services, calls, and Allah. After the prayers, the body is buried. Hello. 
Hello. Hello, Dr. Lin, you are with us? Hello. Hello. I'm sorry, Ahmed, you, you, you mute, I, I'm back, you muted me. I would oh. love for you to speak. Could oh, she sorry. come close? Because we couldn't hear. If everybody else could independently make it easier. If I, Ahmed, mute your microphone unless you're Wajir. Uh, yes, Wajir, uh, uh, your microphone is unmuted. Please, Wajir. I can't hear you. Uh, now you can hear us? So I can't hear you. Why you cannot hear me? Wajir, we can hear you. Just speak. The, in uh, our religion, bodies uh, turn uh, to face towards the Makkah, the holy center of Islam. Then the dead, dead body should be uh, buried as soon as possible and uh, uh, will be uh, with uh, new comb water will be uh, uh, used uh, for uh, uh, the, the body stain in new comb water and then wrap. And uh, then there is a prayer services, which is called Janaza in our religion, and then the body is buried. Do women, okay, do women go to funerals? I think there is a net connection with the, yes. Uh, no, women are not going to the funeral. Sorry, I realized the technology. I, I used a different technology when I did this lecture for UNHCR. So I see that Zoom is more difficult, but thank you, Ajia, for the little you were able to say. Um, and it's interesting, in the same in the Balkans, as I said, women did not go to funerals. Um, I'm interested, how many stages are there? Is there a acute mourning period and then a sort of more gentle mourning period and then you remember every year or something like that? Ahmed? Uh, yes, there's a, it's three days, then a seven days, then almost a 40 days. So it's, yeah, uh, it's that, uh, people, uh, uh, people come to your home and <laughs> recite a Quran, Holy Quran for the, for the betterment of the, uh, the dead person. And uh, the funeral are so big as compared to Christianity, it's more than a, 300, 400, 500 people and people are come to their homes and they're a little bit different and first three days there is no uh, food are not cooked in the home and uh, the relatives are come with the food and they will give the food or uh, when the when a person come for the funeral they will eat a food for the, the that person so that is the little bit culture here. And do you see, therefore, what care we take of each other in these situations, how we support the family, how mourning practices, and this is across religion and culture. Again, Ethiopian Orthodox families have three days where they are in two tents at the house of the family, men in one tent, women in another. This is Orthodox, not Muslim. And all the food is cooked and there's a lot of weeping. But then after that, the intense weeping is not so great. So it's very interesting that religions have recognized this intense period in different ways. I'm going to move on. on. Why will my slides not just move on? That's it. I put this one, it's nothing to do, but just is to show you, this is continuing attention to the dead. So every year in Mexico, there is this day of the dead where you go and celebrate, basically, have a party almost, uh, children have funny masks and whatever, but you're, you are remembering your dead. Do you have something in similar again in Muslim culture? Uh, yes, uh, the, uh, yeah, yes, people go to the graveyard with the flowers and like this, uh, but majority of men, yes, the majority of men. Right. Now here is the key, because what I think one of the big effects of the pandemic, and we'll, I'll spend a little bit of time on this, 
-hmm. is that normal mourning, death is occurring, but normal mourning is affected. This is just a picture from a cartoon, in a way, a painting in Britain. But you see that the old man, his wife is dead, and he cannot even share this period of crying with his family, who are also all crying outside the door because he is shielded, because he is old and vulnerable, so they can't even come and hug him. Yeah. I've just sort of listed the things, and these are global, but all of this is happening in Britain. Your loved one may be dying among strangers in hospital, and your children and you cannot say goodbye. The body is kept or taken away and may not be available for a normal funeral. This is El Salvador, okay? This is a Catholic graveyard would normally be full. My brother's, my, my brother-in-law's mother, um, her, his father died not of COVID, but he died of a normal illness. And the heartbreaking thing was he could not go to be with her. She sat alone in the funeral ch church and even the video broke down. She was completely alone at the funeral which was very, very hard for him and for her. The body itself may be mistreated. Again, these pictures are very powerful as I've taken. This is from Ecuador, where bodies were literally on the street, unconnected. I don't know if anything like that is happening in Pakistan. Are bodies being collected normally, or is there a big problem with that? No, no, it's not a big problem to collect normally. But here, this is very interesting from Sri Lanka, okay, where there's actually some riots and some protests around this because the government was forcing cremation as a kind of health measure. And many uh, Muslim families, as you will understand, were extremely unhappy about this. I don't know if anything like that has happened in Pakistan. No, and no. then, of course, where, the, where there's been mass outbreaks, and I hope that you are saying this is one of the most terrible things, it also happens after disasters, is mass graves. Um, and what that makes you feel like is summed up by this young man. He's in his 30s. He's a maintenance man. His mother is buried in a graveyard like this, and this is what he says. They were just dumped there like dogs. What are our lives worth now? Nothing. So not only is there the disrespect to the dead person, but the way it makes the survivors feel that they themselves are worth nothing. And I think this is one of the most terrible aspects. Of course, one of the ways we comfort each other is to, to hug and to embrace and to kiss. And that is also limited and may not be available at all. And I think of my mother, my brother-in-law's mother sitting alone with no physical comfort of any kind. Now, I particularly, this is actually an Afghan refugee in Pakistan because they have all these problems multiplied. And one of the things that's happened to refugee communities I don't know about in Pakistan is that they've been enclosed or barricaded into various places, quarantined from others. They can't even do the normal things that you know, you may be going to work and it may be dangerous, but at least that is a distraction. You may go to school, that's a distraction. If you're shut up in a refugee camp or a quarantine center, it's even worse. You can't even distract yourself from the pain of death. I just found this in The Guardian while I was doing some research on Pakistan. I don't know if you're aware of this situation on the border of Iran, where um, exactly what they were complaining about be, first of all, it's very unsafe, but secondly, they're completely shut in this camp with no medical facilities. And human rights abuse is unfortunate. I'm sure it's not just to refugees. Vulnerable communities in our own country of all kinds, particularly the homeless, are, now there's some attention to it, but at the beginning, it was a very bad situation for them. I think this is one of the biggest things that happens in mass disasters, not just in corona. When something happens, whether it's the Pakistan earthquake of 2005 or the tsunami of 2005 or the hurricane in the Philippines, especially if it's a big disaster where a lot of people are killed on the same day or in the same few weeks, it doesn't happen so much with long running wars. And people, the newspapers are full of 150,000 died, 50,000 died, 20 died, but there are no names. It's just a number. And I just put this tweet, it's just from Britain. But it came very early on, well, 1st of April, a few weeks ago. And the woman is saying, my mother is not a statistic. She's passed away. Her name was Stella. She loved to dance. She loved us, her heartbroken family. And 
people are feeling that their person they love, this important person has just been turned into a number. And that is the most horrifying aspect of grieving and mourning in this kind of situation. People lose their individuality and the family is left feeling nothing mattered. I first learned these lessons during the tsunami and I'm just going to go into them in a bit more depth because I think they're, they show also what you can do. And it may be short and brief, but it can be a lot. I mentioned the tsunami because for me, it has the most parallels of this situation in that a lot of people died very fast, completely changing the community around me. So that you'd be in a village where 2000 people had lived and there were only 600 people left. Or I was walking down the street in Sri Lanka, the most affected part of Sri Lanka was all Muslim communities. Very interesting, it was, it was bad luck of geography, but that's where they lived. And this man saw me taking pictures. And of course, I was deeply embarrassed. I was holding a camera, taking photographs of empty houses. And he ran up to me and I thought he was going to be angry. And I said, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I, you know, I, I don't mean to offend you. He said, no, take, take a picture of this. And I said, okay. He said, my mother died here. And he taught me a lesson I've never forgotten. He wanted me, a total stranger from the other half of the world to understand the importance of his loss. His mother was not a statistic. Where she lived was important and I should know it and I should remember it. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry, uh, please tell me about her. And he sat down on the pavement, what was left of it, beside me and we talked and he told me all about his mother. And I have never forgotten her. I've never forgotten him. She is not a statistic. And all I did was take a picture and listen. This desire to remain connected, I also learned there. These, this little village, it's UNHCR plastic tents. The government, the government always knows what to do best, wanted everybody to move for safety inland to these barricades, these kind of centers they'd built. As a community, picked up their tents and moved back to this very dangerous area. You can see it was swept clean by the Somani. They, it was very dangerous, but they wanted to live in exactly where their village had been and they reconstructed their village. We were providing some medical services there. And when I asked people, why do you want to be here? There's nothing, there's no shops, nothing, it's dangerous. They want to be close to those we lost and loved. And some people said, we want to be close to our ghosts. It comforts us. Again, being allowed to be connected, even if it puts you at risk, is so important. The trouble is when a lot of people die or a lot of people in the community are dying is that the normal you talked about very eloquently, you know, how the funeral works, everyone comes with food. You don't have to worry about getting the children to school, cooking at least for three or four days because if my family died in a car crash, then the village would move in and take care of me. Now, when it's one death in a village or two deaths in a village, those processes are still going on. And I live in a remote village in England and we haven't had any deaths. So I expect if someone died, that would still happen. But if you live somewhere where many people are dying or many people affected or many people are afraid, then the person who has suffered a loss doesn't get the normal support because people are so worried or they physically can't come or they're protecting each other. And something else I learned and this is told to me most eloquently, actually by a woman after the Pakistan earthquake. And I said, would you like to be in a group with other women who've suffered losses? And she said, don't put me in a group. And I said, why not? And she said, because I will tell her about my loss and she will tell me about her loss and we will both make each other feel worse. I don't want to talk to other people who've suffered. And there's what, it's not denial. It's what I call, I've not seen it written anywhere else, respectful reticence. If I'm worried that your father or your grandfather or your child might be affected by COVID, I'm not gonna burden you with my losses. So outsiders who show themselves as willing to listen or make it clear that they're not affected or that they want to listen are very important. So we come to you. What can you, and I'm, I asked Ahmed, uh, you know, is one of the reasons you want to learn this is may, maybe academic, and that's great. But one of the reasons you may want to understand all of this is he told me that some of you are already volunteering or planning to volunteer in the local communities to help people. Uh, so yes. I hope, yes. 
I hope that this understanding of grief and loss will help you. But still, your first task, and I'm going to, all the points I'm making here, I'm going to give more emphasis in my third lecture where we'll really talk about helping, um, is that you need to make sure, first of all, that people can address their basic needs. Because if someone is starving or has no food or water or feels very unsafe, then all that you can do to help them grieve or deal with stress is not going to be helpful. So you may not have food, water and shelter, but you need to know where they should go to get those things. How can they access the resources they need, the money that they might need, the, the legal papers they might need? I don't know. But you cannot, as a psychologist, say, oh, that's not my job. I'm just here to do counselling. Absolutely not. The first task in any emergency in dealing with any death is to make sure the person suffering can address, can sleep somewhere, can eat, can drink, can feed their children. And then the second task, if you're dealing with grief, is how do we help them mourn? And I've got to, I'm going to come to that in more detail. But they're going to have lots of questions, probably. They may have questions about the mourning processes. Can you answer them? Which again means you need to be informed. What are the local practices? And you may need to know who the local religious leaders are because they probably are the best source of advice, as long, I hope, as that they are obeying government guidelines because I do understand, as in this country, as in the United States, some of these are not. We can discuss that. You are basically accompanying that person. You're being available to them if and when they want to talk and you're making their loss important. Let me explain about that. You're not going in and saying like a grief worker does, oh, you've lost your daddy, you need to talk about it or you'll be really unwell. That is not the approach. But you're going, so are you okay? Do you need anything for the children? Are they getting to, you know, are they managing to do their classes? What are you doing? How are you coping? All those are they okay questions. And so, you know, ever you want to talk, I can listen. That is so important. And they may show they want to talk when you least expect it, like that and on the street in Sri Lanka, or another story like that, I'm in the hospital doing an assessment. I've come to see what mental health facilities are available. This is in the Philippines, and I'm talking to the chief psychiatrist, a very important woman, and she's incredibly busy, and she's given me half an hour of her time to show me around the hospital what they need. And it's a very busy general hospital, and there are people on drips and trolleys, and it's just a frantic place. And we're just standing in the corridor, leaning against a wall, and she's chatting to me and she suddenly says, you know, my mother died. And I go, I'm, I'm so sorry. I was sort of surprised that she just brought it up just then when we were talking about loss. And she said, yes, she drowned. She couldn't swim. Common story. I said, I'm so sorry. And then she started to cry. And then she started to talk about her mother. And there were people going past us who were ill. And I thought, do I stop this or do I listen? I listen because she wanted to talk. And after about 10, 15 minutes, she just sort of wound down. And I said, look, I'm, I'm so sorry. And um, if you want to talk more, I, I'm, I'm available. She said, please come around on Saturday. I want to show you. And so I went to her house on Saturday. I was making her loss important to me. And I was able to listen. I didn't force her to talk. Please note the distinction. And of course, another thing, and you know this yourselves because you want to help, is we all feel better when we're given the opportunity to help others. And if those arise in simple ways, make it possible. If you need help doing something and that person has a skill they can help you, ask them to help. If they don't want to talk about it, don't make them. Very important. People who are avoiding are avoiding for good reason. It's a useful psychological me mechanism. I've put some more detail here because one of the things I've been thinking about a lot, and I have a leaflet that I will sell send to Ahmed, because I work with children, what do we do when we can't do the normal things that we do to mourn? And of course, the key people to advise you in this are your spiritual leaders, the faith leaders in the community. But I really hope that they're not advising things that involve close proximity. I've seen some pictures and stories. My own prime minister has gone bonkers today. Um, Mr. Trump, we won't even discuss him that you're not always getting the best advice from the people you expect to understand. So your psychologists make sure that any practices do protect people's health. And you want to find a way to hold a commemoration in a way that is respectful, but also keeps people safe. 
Maybe it's going to be a temporary one and you'll have a proper one later. Maybe the body won't be treated in the way that you would normally like. How can you help that person adapt to this? Take time to sit down together and think, how will we hold the ceremony? If you've got children, and I have a whole leaflet on this, as a whole way, you really have to let children know the truth. They know something weird's going on. And if they don't get honest, clear communication that's appropriate to their age, they're going to be more distressed. For people who live in very crowded situations and graveyards are not available or the body is not available to them, is there another way of creating a memorial in that place, somewhere they can go and think and pay attention to the person who died? Is it a picture? Is it a box with objects on it? Is it a place nearby? I don't know. And there'll be different solutions in urban environments, in rural environments, in places where there are graveyards, in places where there aren't. But these are things you do need to think about and they're psychologically very important. And always I'm saying, remember this is temporary. There will be a time when you can have a proper culturally appropriate memorial and you can hold the kind of ceremony you would like. And of course, as I said, your religious leaders are enormously important. This is from the Gaza, but you see he is praying for people in an empty mosque. Okay, of course, if people are physically or psychologically unwell, you may want to help them with relaxation, with stress reduction. I'm gonna talk more about symptomatic relief in another lecture. I've already said, do not force talking, but be able to listen. And seeing someone frequently for not for long is often much more supportive than hanging out with them just once for a few hours. I've already talked about not imposing groups, helping people to remember the good stuff, if that's what they want to do, is much more important and is a distraction often from painful memories. If you have someone who is having repeated intrusive painful memories, you really do need cognitive psychological skills. That's a whole lecture in itself. I'm not gonna give it here. Some of you may have those skills. If you don't, you need to refer. The, most, the thing you're looking for is functionality. Is someone after, I mean, there may be a period when they are catatonically sad and crying and in the first acute days. But after a set period of time, you do expect people to function to get their children up, to go to school, to do their job, whatever it is. It might be online teaching, it might be just doing the washing up, but you do expect them to function. And that will also distract them from their own grief. So you want to support people getting back to a normal life. I've put tracing of missing, but that's less losing. People are carried off to hospital and they don't know where, and finding out where that person is can be enormously important. I've added this reference, um, which is the MH gap, it comes from WHO and UHR, has a lot of what I said, some of what I said, it's more for clinical yes, guidance for health. Anyway, I'm putting in these do nots, someone's microphone is on, someone has children and their microphone is on. No? Okay. Um, okay. That manual I gave you, a lot of research has been done on what we can and can't do. And this is the evidence from WHO. And by structural who's can you turn your microphones off, guys? Because it's very distracting for me. Um, that's grief work, what I told you before. Forcing people to talk about it when they don't want to, formal going through the stages of grief. It's been shown that you should not do that for all adults and children. It used to be done in this country. It's harm, and the evidence against doing it is using tranquilizers. Now, you're not prescribers. Help is saying, oh, you know, I just need some sleeping tablets. That is really not helpful, especially in grief. The sleeplessness of grief is a natural reaction. It may even be helpful that the person for two or three nights doesn't sleep and weeps. That is normal. And suppressing it with benzodiazepines is just going to delay that. So we don't give sleeping tablets to young or old who are grieving. I've told you about grief work. I've laid this out. Some people who are not sad at the beginning are not sick. People who are not talking about their dead loved one are not sick. You don't the other big thing that used to be done with grief work is 
You should move on to kind of forgetting the dead person so you can make new relationships. We know that's wrong. You don't, you know, it's, I know an old woman who still talks to her husband 30 years after he died. She's not psychotic. It's her continuing the relationship with her. She has a normal life. She doesn't not do the other things in her life, but she still feels his presence every day. There's no harm in that. Okay, I just put some tips here because these are sort of things that come up when I'm working with people who are grieving. They, they often bring up memory. And one thing you might want to sort out if you're not quite sure is if somebody's saying, oh, I can't stop thinking about him. One of the things I do try to sort out is are those memories you choose to have or are they pushing themselves in? I say this because with traumatic deaths, you do need to sort this out. So I had children who lost their family in a massacre in Kosovo. And if what they were remembering was seeing the family be shot down in front of them, that's a traumatic memory that you do not want to have every day. But if on the other hand, as one girl in the family, the two girls were very different. So one had those unpleasant memories, but the other girl said, oh no, I just remember us going to Greece together. I love that holiday, our last holiday in Greece. Every day we went to the beach. Those are lovely memories. And she was enjoying them and they were comforting her. So are they comforting or frightening memories? Are they accompanied by physical symptoms? If you're seeing your family, if you're seeing your husband being dragged in or put in the ambulance and you're standing weeping and you can't say goodbye to him, that's an upsetting memory and not one you necessarily want to have. If you're remembering him sitting opposite you in the chair across the fireplace and he's smiling at you, that's a comforting memory. And you need to sort it out because if they're traumatic memories, they may need help in avoiding those and having the comforting one. Now, you may be able to do that with simple cognitive distraction techniques. I can't teach you those now, but you may need more advice. And don't be frightened for asking for it. But as I said, memory, the whole point of mourning processes, the whole point of the funeral ceremony, the whole point of what we do when we go to memorials or graveyards is we remember. So allowing people to say, I remember this, I remember that, saying they dreamt about it, there's no harm in that. When my, gran my own grandmother died, uh, we had a lovely housekeeper. She was from the Philippines. She was a, a, a profoundly religious woman. She was also Catholic. But every morning she was helping me clean up my grandmother's house and sort out her belongings. And she'd get up quite cheerfully in the morning. So oh, I dreamt about your grandmother last night. She was talking to me. And I was really jealous because I was not having those dreams. And she was clearly being comforted by this conversation she was having every night with my gran. So it's not bad to dream and talking to the dead can be normal. Okay, my key lesson from the lecture, people grieve differently. You do recover. It's not the moment to make big life-changing decisions. Do the best you can. And this, we all know that life is never going to be the same. I mean, we are all in a sense, possibly grieving for a lost life. So that last one is important for all of us. And the experiences that we have now are going to be important for the rest of our lives. Um, I'm not, there's a little, I don't know where we are with time now. If, when you have time, you have these slides. Um, I can't do it because it doesn't work on Zoom, but I've given you the link here of a funeral in Ireland, obviously not Muslim, but what was so interesting about it was the way they have adapted to the current situation. And there's a procession and everybody is socially spaced out. And it's actually very moving to see this hearse, you know, a car moving through this countryside with all the people who'd come out to say goodbye, standing at a safe distance away from the hearse. You can watch it if you want, because you'll get the slides. So, Ahmed, that is the end of the lecture. I don't know how much time we've got, if there's any time for discussion or questions. What time is it? Hello? Hello? Can anyone hear me still? Ahmed, I can't hear you. It's, a, it's hear almost 4.12. 4.12. Oh, it's almost what? Four twelve, four, four twelve. Okay, so we have. I have a bit of time. Yeah. That means, and so I put that in my time. It's it's twelve minutes past noon in my country. Yes. So I have time. 
because mm. I, I gave myself an hour and a half, but it's completely up to you. If people have to leave, I understand that. If people want to discuss or make points or ask questions, please do. And hopefully Ahmed can unmute you and you can ask your questions so everybody can yeah. hear. No, you can mute yourself. So you can ask the question, just unmute yourself. I allow, I allow you. Am I supposed to be? I just you asking. Oh, you're asking everybody to unmute. Yeah. Yes. I, I, anybody can unmute yourself. Any question? Nyla has a question, I think. No? Oh, she is. Don't be shy. Or if you want to write into the chat box, I can also read those. Any questions in the chat box? I will share, I will share the slides. Thank you very much. Very nice and I'm informative. Please don't be shy. Or if you have points to make, um, yourself from any experience of working in this area that you want to share. Okay. Okay, no questions. All right. Uh, if we have, yes, ma'am, if we have a long-term uh, long grief and progressive grief, then, what, then it can cause a mental disorder, uh, depression and stress. Okay, that's a, a good question. Can you hear me? Um, so prolonged yes, grief, the reason, that, the reason that there is something called prolonged grief disorder is that it is that, first of all, two things. One, yes, grief can cause depression in some people. And depression is, an, if, if it's an illness, it's going to be affecting your appetite, your energy, your contact with others, your mood will be very sad, you won't get enjoyment in your normal activities. We say, well, all of those things happen in normal grief. So the reason we say it's very important to understand if someone suffered a loss or not is that if I have someone come to me within a few weeks or even a few months of losing someone important in their lives and they have those symptoms, initially, I would be saying, I think this is grief rather than depression. But if it is continuing over a long period or it appears to be unrelated to the loss, I may say, okay, this is looking more like a depressive illness because you're not functioning, you're not doing, you're having these symptoms and it's now a year after you have suffered this loss and it's really going on too long. Now, prolonged grief disorder is a little bit different from depression. It's actually, you may have symptoms of low mood, but the big thing about prolonged grief disorder is this preoccupation and yearning and desire in a sense to undo the past. You, you can't let go of that connection. Your inability to let go of that connection is stopping you function in a normal way long after that person has died. To give you an example, I, I was working with a boy in the Balkans after the Balkan War. I, I met him two years after his brother had been killed in the conflict. Every day, he watched the video of the funeral. Every day, he went to his brother's bedroom. He liked his brother's clothes. When I tried to talk to him about himself, he really only wanted to talk about his brother. And his parents really only wanted him to be his brother. Now he was going to school and he was doing his work, but he couldn't concentrate and he was distracted. That to me was, wasn't the diagnosis didn't exist in those years, but that was prolonged grief disorder. Now I came back and saw him two years later and he had recovered of his own accord. He, in a sense, first of all, he stopped identifying with his brother. Secondly, he'd stopped watching the funeral video. Thirdly, he was doing well at school. So I hope I've given you a picture there of what you have. And you can help these people. Okay. Does that help? Anticipatory. I don't actually know what uh, the term anticipatory grief means. It may be before it's used some by some people to 
you know that your mother is going to die of cancer and you start grieving before she died. The term is used sometimes in that context. Um, what you want to do, uh, Ms. Saeed, uh, it's good if you share your questions with everybody because this is to me privately, so I'll read it. If someone is grieving for a long time and she does not share anything, what should we do? I mean, again, forcing, if it depends how the grief is affecting her functionality. If she doesn't want to discuss her losses and she's functioning normally, I would say nothing. If it's stopping her participating in normal life and she shut herself away, but she doesn't want to talk about it, you could, you know, I'd be saying, look, what I see is that you shut yourself away. I'm not asking you to talk about these sad feelings you have, but what can we do to help you return to normal life? Because this is not a, a way to live. If that's not working, I would be seeking professional help. Okay. Um, cause a, certainly when you're grieving acutely, your memory, uh, like any psychological process, you know, if I'm worried about something that affects my memory, if I'm worried about passing an exam, my memory for other things may be affected. Our minds, that, you know, when we're thinking about one thing, we're thinking about the loss of a loved one, then yes, we're going to be distracted and not remember things. Okay, uh, we as a psychology student are taught ourselves to cope with grief situations. It's difficult to help people cope because people don't really understand. I'm not sure I understand the question. I've tried to help you understand the grieving per process but everybody grieves in their own way so i never go to a person and say you have to grieve in this way however they are reacting will be their way and my way is to help them function and cope with un uncomfortable feelings and do you understand i don't know if i managed to answer that who is that person you may have to make that question a bit clearer to me so a company be available through whatever experiences they are having. I don't impose a way of grieving on a person. Um, can grief result in a mental disability? I did try to answer that question in the lecture. May look at the slides. It mimics mental health problems. It is not a mental disorder, but people who are grieving are more vulnerable to mental health problems. I know that's complex, but that is the answer. Okay. Um, can I uh, hang on? That's important. Counsel her loved ones on the same grief they are going through. So um, I'm I'm saying so. I'm a psychologist. My uh, partner's father dies. I mean, I'm presumably going to be a little bit sad myself, but there's no reason why I can't be supportive, especially if I have an understanding. You know, I may know that it's really important that we find some way to commemorate, discuss, and make this father feel loved, important, and significant. And one of the most important things you can do if someone you love has lost someone is show them how important that person was and how much you value them and share with them. I, I would think. I'm, I don't quite know what you mean by counselling. I try to avoid words like counselling, which sound technical, because I think supporting people through grief is not just a job for a counsellor, it's a job for a normal person. And I hope I've been clear about it in the lecture. This is not a psychological illness that requires counselling or grief work. It is a normal process that requires love and understanding from all of us, especially helping people to mourn, and giving people significance. We've lost a lot to, due to COVID, but does that mean we're grieving? I think it does in a sense. If you're feeling loss and you're thinking, oh, I really miss X, Y, and Z, that is a mild, I mean, it might not, you know, you miss going to the pub. I'm not gonna be having a grief reaction about that, but I have a sense of loss, not so much for the pub because I don't drink, but for the community where I went to sing and meet with my friends. And I, I don't, grieve but i miss it um if you've lost something if you've lost your job you can certainly be grieving or you've lost your role it may not have even been a financial job but you had a particular role in a particular situation you can certainly grieve for that and i like that yes we grieve because we love very important 
Anything else, anyone else? Uh, some participants is out, out from, outside from the Pakistan, from Oman. Is there any question from the... Uh, just, I just want to answer this. I, I, if you go through my slides again, Wahija, I spent maybe the middle third of the lecture explaining why the pandemic created additional strain for the bereaved, largely for its impact on mourning. Please review those slides again. <laughs> Because otherwise, I'd just have to go through them again. I'm sorry if they weren't clear. Maybe when you've gone through them again, um, come back to me with specific questions. Hmm. I'm sorry about that, because that's really what the lecture was about. OK. Yes, I will share the slides. OK. OK, well, it's coming up to the end, so I'll end there. Um, I look forward to talking with you next week about uh, acute stress. Um, yeah, that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm going to send you a leaflet. Um, Cherise, is that Cherise Alley? Ah, hello. What are you doing in this lecture? <laughs> you know all this. Um, so, um, um, I am going to talk about acute stress and a little bit about PTSD next week. And then I'm going to talk about uh, sort of, I hate the term, psychological first aid the week after. Um, I will share my slides. And um, yeah, that's it. Uh, uh, Ahmed, can I just have a word with you when everybody's gone? Just, just Can we just chat just to get everything clear? Uh, yes, we can. I'm going to share a leaflet with you that is how to cope with, how to communicate with children about death. And it also has some tips on mourning, which is for the family. Okay, okay. great. Yeah. I will send you another link for a personal talk. Okay, Ahmed, that'd be great. Lovely. Thank okay. you, everybody. Bye. You, Lovely to talk Thank to you, you. all uh, and meet uh, you all. Uh, Dr. Sajid Alvi, the head of department, will talk to you. Ms. Sajid. Oh, Ms. Sajid. Please. Madam, thank you very much. Uh, it's very informative and comprehensive. Thank you and see you again, inshallah, next Monday. Thank, thank you, you very much, Professor. And thank you for attending. I hope it wasn't all stuff you already knew, but thank you. Okay. Very comprehensive and informative. Thank you, Madam. Great. Bye. Oh, bye. Okay. I'll send, I'll send you the link of e on email. For Okay, great. Okay. Allah, Allah Hafiz. All of you, okay, bye. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming here. Thank you.